my lot. <laughs> so a lot of scientists wear things like lab coats. It's probably how a lot of people picture scientists. I don't. My science uniform is a pair of waders. That's what these big pants here are called, and a heck of a lot of mud. Um, and that's exactly the way I like it and how I like to do um, my science and how, how it works because I'm an ecologist. So in order to figure out how things work in nature, I have to be there and I have to be looking at it. Um, and that's the way I've always liked to be. So, oops, there we go. Um, and so this is baby Jess and this was the uniform I wore then. So this is, it's a giant like yellow rain suit. I had a few of them as I grew up and it kept me from ruining all of my clothes because I was always in the mud. I was flipping over rocks and logs and finding whatever animals I could find there like turtles and snakes and frogs. And I really fell in love with them. Um, so that's a big part of my journey is that I got to do that as a kid. And we lived in the suburbs, which wasn't like, there wasn't a ton of nature, but whatever bits I could get at, um, I went to. If there was a local stream, I was in it with a stick, probably fishing around. Um, so I always knew I had this interest in nature, but I didn't really see a lot of people who looked like me studying it or in positions where they, um, where they looked at how, how nature worked and studied these animals that I fell in love with. I really didn't see a lot of women in that position. So when I was really little, I didn't understand that I could do that. It didn't seem like a career prospect I could actually have. Um, but as I got older, I started diving more and more into science. I did arts and science in SAGEP, which I really enjoyed. Um, and then during my undergrad at McGill, got to work in quite a few cool places. So I did research in the McGill Herbarium, in the Red Path Museum, and in the Canadian Museum of Nature, um, which was all really fun studying sea turtles in the museums there. And when doing that, I was like, oh, I really like research. And I can do research. Like, I, I really enjoyed that. And then also during my undergrad, I um, did some really cool internships. I did an internship with the Eco Museum Zoo and also did some dissections and some animal preparations in the Red Path Museum. And in doing that, I was like, okay, I really like being on the front lines. I like working with the animals that I want to conserve and protect and research. Um, and I, so like, I liked both. I liked research and I liked the actual like physically being with the animals and studying them that way versus in a Petri dish, which some people really like, um, but wasn't my jam. So from there, I went on to volunteer in um, the lab I'm currently working in, which is the green lab at the Red Path Museum. And they studied toads. And I was like, I love toads. Can I hang out? And they're like, yes. Um, so the first thing I did was I helped um, study these toads that were from Long Point, Ontario. And we looked into who, which individuals were who. So these wart pattern on the back of a toad is like a fingerprint. It's unique to every single individual. So my supervisor, David Green, has been studying these toads for over 30 years now, like this specific population. And he has tracked who each individual toad is over the years. So we know their lifespan, we know where they go day to day. We know what they're doing. And that's really important for their conservation and for reporting how this endangered population is doing. I also worked um, with a data set of toads from Ecuador with a student named Pablo who um, who's published a paper on it here and how um, those toads use different functional strategies. So different um, ways of breeding, different things they ate at these different altitudes in mountains in Ecuador. And in doing that, I was like, okay, now I'm doing research, just publishing papers. And I really like that. And I also found out I really liked that lab. And that's important if you're thinking of going into science that you also like the people who you're working with and you feel comfortable there and you're comfortable asking questions. It's a place you can grow. Um, so I did a lot of work there. Um, I went to the field for the first time where I'm working now in Long Point, Ontario. This is my first day of field work, very excited. Um, and started working with the toads. I started off doing a master's and then fast tracked into my PhD. So I've been there for a while um, studying the same system and I really, really enjoy it. I love it very much. I get to work with an amazing group too. Um, and a lot of us are women. So when I was growing up, I didn't see a lot of women doing this or rather any. Um, and now there's many of us and there's a lot of campaigns like hashtag herpers and snakes are for girls. 
um, and all sorts of things like this. Because frankly, we get told a lot that we shouldn't be here, even by other people within our field. Um, and it's important to speak back to that and be this other voice so that other people who are coming in know, hey, actually, you're more than welcome here and you absolutely belong. So that's always been a really important um, part of my science. And I consider it to be like a part of what I do as a scientist is encourage others to be one and show them that they are indeed welcome here, even if other people say they aren't, we're making places for them. So before you all get to the fun part of my talk, where we actually talk about the toads. Um, are there any questions so far about my journey or how I got here? I don't think I see any in the chat. Yeah, I don't see anything so far. All right, cool. Well, if you want to stick questions in for later, feel free, go ahead. Um, and we'll get to them then. But I'm sure you're all dying to hear about my toads. So I'll tell you about them now. So I study tadpoles. Here's one. Um, they're tiny creatures. And the ones I study are just jet black and live in the water. Um, and we ask a lot of questions about the toads. And I actually do a lot of outreach like this with little kids. Um, and they always ask me three main questions about the toads. Um, they ask, where do they live? What do they eat? And what do they do? And this question I get asked in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's, what are they doing? Sometimes it's, do they have friends? So how are they interacting with other animals? Um, from adults, I get this question too, but it's a bit different. It's often something like, why are they important or why should I care? Um, so it's a really important question to answer. Um, and out of these three, it's the hardest one. So people ask me, well, where do they live? I can answer that. They live in the ponds, they live in streams, live anywhere where there's water, puddles on the side of the road, they're happy. Um, they don't need much. So they live almost anywhere where there's a shallow, sandy bottom pool of water. What do they eat? And that one gets a little bit harder, right? Because remember, we've overlooked these animals, but there's not that many studies on them. Um, so while with most things, like, yeah, we know what they eat, with tadpoles, we're like, well, I know they don't eat apples and pizza and donuts. Um, but they, what do they eat is a kind of a harder question. Like, well, we think algae, we're pretty sure they eat that. They might eat other things too. Sometimes they end up eating each other. Um, so it's kind of a harder question to answer of what really do they eat? We aren't, we don't really know. Um, and that makes it really difficult to answer that question of what do they do? And what do they do is an important question to answer, not only for their ecology, but for protecting these animals. It's important that we can bring it to politicians and say, here's why it's important. Here's why we need to protect it. We can bring it to the people who live in the towns where these toads live and say, here's why you can't build that seawall because we need these animals to stay here. Um, and it's a question I'm looking into and that I don't fully know the answer of yet, but we're gonna figure it out. Um, and I keep saying that I study this in ponds where the toads are there and where they're not. Um, and I do this to help figure out what will happen if we lose them. Um, that's something I, that's important to figure out and because it's not a theoretical question. It's not like some theoretical, oh, perhaps one day we may lose these toads and then what will, what will happen? It's happening right now. So this is a map of, um, from Amphibia Web, which is a really wonderful resource. If you're interested in amphibians, I suggest you check it out. Um, and there's a lot on it, so I'll walk you through it a bit. But it shows basically the amount of amphibians, so frogs, toads, and cilians. Um, that are endangered or critically endangered in different parts of the world. So if we look at North America here, this 440 number at the bottom is the total number of amphibians that we know about in North America. In this red circle is the number of them that are critically endangered or extinct. And in this orange circle is the number that are endangered or vulnerable. So on a little list here, this is bad, this is very bad. We really want them to get up here. So there, if you just look quick look at this graph, at this map, you can see that in a lot of countries, a lot of amphibians are very endangered. Um, and don't worry, we did the math for you. So that's 32% um, of amphibian species globally that we know about and that we evaluated. Um, so it's probably an underestimate in the end, are threatened with extinction. Then 168 species extinctions have happened in just the past 20 years alone of amphibians. So there, it makes them the most threatened group of vertebrates on the planet, at least by our current data. 
Um, so they, they are disappearing. So it's not like a theoretical thing of, oh, what if they are disappearing and it's really important that we act urgently and that we find out what these causes are and why they're important so that we can stop that happening. So um, I look at these mesocosms to see how they change when they're there or not. In an attempt to help out with this question of what do they do so that we can better protect um, these species and know what happens if we do lose them so we can prepare for that if it happens. Um, so in order to know what they're doing in these mesocosms or these big artificial ponds, we have to know what else is in the pond with them. Um, so there's lots of things. There's things like nitrogen and phosphorus. So those are nutrients in the pond. They're important because they're limiting nutrients. That means that if you don't have them, no matter how many other nutrients you have, your algae can't grow. Speaking of algae, it's also algae in the pond. Um, there's two kinds. There's phytoplankton that floats around in the water and periphyton. It's an algae that grows on surfaces. And there's also other animals in the pond with them. Um, in my mesocosms, there's zooplankton. So kind of like plankton from SpongeBob. Um, they're like that, but they're these tiny microscopic animals that float around in, in the water with the tadpoles. And they're really important. All these factors in the environment are really important to the rest of the environment as well. They're the base of food webs. So without them, the whole system could collapse. So I take samples of all these different parts of the food web um, using my very scientific equipment, like a toothbrush and a turkey baster. Um, and I bring them back to the lab, and I, which is here in, at McGill, and I analyze them to see how much it's changed. It's one thing to say it looks one way or another, but it's another thing to actually get those numbers. So that's what I do back at, at McGill with all these samples I collect over the summer. And all of these different parts of the food web are connected in a lot of different ways. So the nutrients like the nitrogen and phosphorus get uptaken by the algal species. So the phytoplankton, it floats around and the periphyton that's on surfaces. And then the tadpoles and the zooplankton both eat this algae, but they have different favorites. They have different favorite foods. Um, so the tadpoles really prefer to eat periphyton and the zooplankton really prefer to eat the phytoplankton. The tadpoles though also might eat some zooplankton, either on purpose or not. And then the tadpoles waste feeds back into these nutrient systems. And this is a simplified food web, of course, um, but you can see even in this, everything's really connected to each other and you need all these different parts of the ecosystem in order for it to work. Um, and this is how a lot of these ecosystems work in the wild with these tadpoles because they're really simple systems. They don't have a lot of nutrients. They're sometimes they're puddles, they're little pools. So there aren't all, always a ton of other animals in there with them. And so we have these, these simple systems to work with or simple-ish, simpler than some other ones. So if you would like to put in the chat, I'll give you a minute. Um, but given our, our food web, what do you think might be something that happens um, with the tadpoles disappear to something like algae if we were to do this? And this is what I do when I first start doing um, doing my science or when I'm forming hypotheses and trying to figure out experiments as I look at what we, the information that we have and I try to make a hypothesis about what, um, what could happen. So stick some hypotheses in the chat if you've got one. And there's no wrong answers here because we don't truly know everything about these species. So it's kind of a fun exercise. Oh, I have one. More algae in the pond. Excellent. Especially because they eat it, right? So that's a really direct effect that tadpoles could have. Does anyone else have anything you'd like to add? No? Well, let's explore um, this idea of more algae in the pond, because that was my example. So that's perfect. Um, so when there's tadpoles in the pond, there's these two kinds of algae that they eat, right? So you got these tadpoles. We've got algae that grows on surfaces and algae that floats around in the water. Their favorite food is the periphyton. So they eat lots of that. And they'll also eat this algae that floats around in the water. And when that's one tadpole, okay, it's a tadpole swimming around eating algae. But my toads, oh, that's chat. Fewer nutrients since there's no feedback. That's an awesome um, idea as well. And I'll, I'll talk more about it at the end, but yeah, they, it, a lot of the ecosystem gets affected by the tadpoles not being there, including that feedback loop. So one tadpole in a pond eats some algae, that's great, but there's not one. 
Um, if you remember in my example ponds, my mesocosms that I make, there's a hundred of them in there. And that's not any kind of exaggeration. The average toad lays 4,000 eggs in one go. So there's thousands of tadpoles in these big ponds. So lots and lots of tadpoles eat lots and lots of algae. And this actually works, I've found, to keep the water pretty clear. When the tadpoles aren't there, there isn't something that functionally replaces them. So that means that there isn't something else to eat the algae in the same way that they do. So they don't get replaced by like a snail or some other animal. So that means that when they're not there, the algae just grows and it grows and it grows. And this turns the water green. So here's what it looks like in real life. So here, these two artificial ponds were established in the same time. They have been, they've existed for the same amount of time. They got the same amount of sunlight. They got the same amount of nutrients to start. They, everything is the same. The only difference is that this pond here has no tadpoles and this one has a hundred tadpoles. And you can see that this one is green and slimy, it's gross. Um, there's this huge visual difference of way more algae growing in this pond um, or this mesocosm than in this one here where you can see the bottom there and it's much clearer, it's much cleaner. Um, so that's really cool in my mesocosms and my experimental little ponds. But how does that look in the wild? Does it hold true? And so far it does. So this is a satellite photo of these two ponds that are near our field site. Um, and the toads gave us a nice little natural experiment. They really liked breeding in one of the ponds. They decided, oh, we're not gonna breed in the other one this year. We don't want it. And we monitor them so we know where, where they're all breeding. So this one down here had thousands of tadpoles in it. And you can see it's like, it like looks muddy, but that's normal for a pond, um, but it's pretty clear. And this one up here that has no tadpoles in it is, you can see that same visual effect, same like there's a lot more algae there. It's a lot greener, it's a lot thicker, it's slimy, frankly. Um, and so that same difference that's happening in my mesocosms is happening in the wild when we look at it there. And a lot of other animals get affected by this too. I showed you the food web of what's going on in the pond, but these ponds are part of huge wetland systems. So a lot of these other animals come and they'll use these ponds, even if they aren't permanent or semi-permanent for the summer residences of it. So that includes animals like turtles that come and they like hunt in these ponds or they'll bask in them or swim around. A lot of animals um, like insect larvae, so this is dragonfly larvae, um, and water beetles are in these ponds and they get affected by the amount of algae is there if the tadpoles aren't. Sometimes fish come in. They come in from storms. So a lot of these ponds don't usually have fish, but sometimes the lake will wash a fish in and then they'll end up in those ponds and they get affected by, um, by these differences as well. And also those zooplankton I mentioned earlier get really affected by the tadpoles being there or not because it changes the whole dynamic of how the algae works in the pond and what species are present. And so that changes how the zooplankton react to it too. And even animals that don't live in the ponds at all get affected by this. So we got this huge wetland system. And when the tadpoles are present, lots of animals come and they use it. Um, when the tadpoles are absent and these ponds turn green and gross, then animals like dragonflies that normally lay their eggs in the pond will find different ones. Animals like these birds that come and they'll eat all this abundance of dragonflies that are usually there will go elsewhere. They'll disappear because the dragonflies aren't there for them to consume. Animals like turtles that normally swim around in those ponds, like I mentioned, will go to different ones. And even really big animals like coyotes will seek out ponds to drink from that are clearer. Uh, and so they'll leave the area as well. So everything from these tiny, tiny little zooplankton, you can only see with a microscope, to really big animals like birds and coyotes get affected by these tadpoles being there or not. And that's a huge deal because we didn't even look at them before a few years ago um, and consider them as something that was so important to the ecosystem. So um, now that you know they're really important, I mentioned before they were disappearing. So would anyone like to put in the chat some things you've heard about why toads or frogs are disappearing or why they're endangered? Maybe you heard it on the news or from a friend or, or whatever. Or just something you think.
Loss of habitat. That's an excellent one. It's something that happens to a lot of different animals. And it's something that's happening to the toads. I'll talk about it in a second. Loss of food, also very true. Affected by fungal diseases, that's awesome. And a lot of these things can tie in with each other, right? If you have loss of habitat, then maybe the food that was in that habitat you also lost. Maybe you're closer together so you get more diseases. So all of these are really excellent examples. Um, great job, everyone, <laughs> that, that tie in with, with each other as well. So some things that happen, some people said diseases. Another thing that affects these animals a lot are things like pollutants. So frogs and toads have this really cool ability. They can breathe water, breathe water, drink water through their skin. They can just absorb it up. And they can breathe through their skin. They can pull in um, oxygen that way. So this is great if you're a toad, but it also means that they're basically like a sponge. So anything in that environment that's harmful, a disease, a pollutant, a chemical is not supposed to be in the water. Anything like that can make these frogs really, and these toads really sick. And when they're sick, they don't produce eggs and they won't produce offspring. So that's one way we can lose the tadpoles is that the adults actually get sick. Another thing that was mentioned is habitat loss. And that's absolutely something that's happening to this population as well. So here's a little um, picture of the habitat that the toads use. And here's the beach where they go hunting and they soak up water at night. Here are the dunes. The dunes are where they go bury themselves during the day so they don't dry up and also where they hibernate. And back here um, are the ponds that they breed in. So they, the adult toads need all three parts of this habitat in order to function um, and in order to like live out their life cycle. And um, one thing that's really happening to this part of the habitat, the part they breed in, um, is that an invasive plant has come in and it's resulted in a lot of habitat loss. While it's still physically there, we're like, oh, it's a protected area. No one built a house on it. This invasive plant has taken it away from the toads too. So if we look here, we can see there's like a lot of like beige going out to the horizon. You can see it better in this picture, but this tall beige grass that goes out as far as the eye can see. All of that is an invasive plant called Phragmites. Um, it's invasive because it's from Europe, it's not from Canada. And it grows way closer together than native aquatic reeds do in Canada. So it literally makes like a wall. And the toads can't get through it and it fills in their ponds. These two, and if they can't get to their ponds, they can't lay eggs in them. Um, and so we lose, we lose these tadpoles. These two ponds here, they're kind of rectangular. Um, it's because they're man-made. So we tried to dig new ponds for the toads. Thought maybe that would help. And the toads hated them. At the point when we dug them, we didn't fully know what the toads needed. We thought we did. Um, but these ponds very quickly became very deep and very cold. And toads don't like that. They want it shallow and sandy and warm. Um, and part of the reason it became deep and cold is actually an effect of climate change. Um, and it's that we had the water start rising. So all of this is a sand spit, which means it's very affected by the level of water, it's pretty flat. Um, and the Lake Erie has been rising in the past few years. So this is a picture of my field site from the air. This little pin means we're in the same spot. Um, and this, you can see there's lots of beach here. There's lots of dune. There's lots of like pond behind it. So this was in 2016. This is the same spot in 2017. You can see that there's a lot less beach, but it's still there um, and there's some dunes. And this is that same spot in 2019. And you can see the beach has all but disappeared um, and it looks really very different. And we need all three parts of their habitat. So now they're also losing that beach part um, that they need as well to hunt on and to soak up water from. So this is a picture of the beach I walk every night, it's really quite lovely. Um, but in 2017, and here's the same spot in 2019. Um, it's from a different angle because I'm on top of a dune because the beach is gone. These huge trees that held the dunes in um, had fallen into the water and uh, there was like no beach habitat, there was no dune habitat, it was just a cliff. And this was a really, really hard year for the toads. Um, so another thing I do, in addition to studying them to help the toads out since they're so endangered and obviously having a bit of a rough time, um, is I raise them. So they can't use their natural ponds. We still need toads. We know they're so important for the environment. So I raise them up and this is what they look like when I first find them usually. Um, these little black squiggly lines or little black beads. 
um, in egg jelly, just as eggs. And this is what they look like when I release them as toadlets. So little tiny toads release back into the wild. We released some of the tadpoles too earlier on to help maintain that environment. Um, so we've released over 7,000 tadpoles. And this number is actually up past 1,000 now um, of little tiny baby toadlets back into the environment. And here's a big bucket of tadpoles that we're putting back into a pond that the adult toads couldn't get to to try and maintain that area. So here's a little video of all my, all my little toadlets going free. They're just teeny little things. They're all my babies. I love them very much. So here's one right here is hopping. And he hops like straight into a stick. It's like the one obstacle in his path. But you can see they're really, really tiny. Um, when we release them. And so our hope is that we release a whole bunch that they'll, they'll survive and they'll start doing um, better. But releasing a ton of animals into an environment that isn't working for them doesn't work. It's not, you can't save a species by just throwing a bunch of them out there and hoping for the best. The habitat that you put them in has to be suitable for them again. Um, and in 2019, it wasn't. We try, to, we try in our best, we're trying to maintain these populations. And the point of doing all of these releases um, over these years hasn't been that we think it's miraculously gonna save the toads. It's really been that we want to keep the population at such a level that when the habitat could return to normal, which was possible, it's a sense, but it's super dynamic. But when the habitat could return to a point where the toads can use it, that there are enough toads left that they can take advantage of that. And so that's what we were doing by maintaining that population as best we could, is that we were maintaining it so that they can start doing it on their own again. That was the hope. And 2020 was a terrible year, but one really good thing happened in it. And that was a massive storm came in and it knocked down the dunes um, on, on Long Point where the toads are. And it, that knocked down the dunes, buried the frag, and they created these new little shallow sandy ponds, which if you remember is exactly what the toads want. Um, so here's a picture of one here, and here is a picture of our fancy brand new drone we got this year um, of how this habitat looks right now in 2021. So you can see there's these really suitable toad ponds all here and all along the beach. So there's breeding habitat again. There's bury yourself in the daytime dune habitat again, um, and there's beach habitat again. So we're really hoping, okay, we did this, Will the toads use it? Like, did it work? Were there enough left? And there were. So I don't know how well you can hear this, but if we listen, can you hear that? That's a Fowler's toad call. Um, it's been described as sounding kind of like a, a distressed child or a dying sheep. But to us, it's a beautiful noise um, because that means that they're breeding. Um, this is their breeding call, and it was something that we would occasionally hear from 2017 to 2020. Sometimes we'd hear them. Um, we got really excited every time we did, but it was only ever one. They're supposed to call in a chorus, so like a whole bunch of them together calling. Um, and in 2021, we actually got choruses again. They started calling together. They started calling a lot, enough that we could like tape it. It wasn't just like one, a one-off thing. Um, and they actually did breed in these ponds now that they exist again. So this is a really special video. This is the first tadpoles that we found that were wild. So the first tadpoles since 2017 from Fowler's Toads that I did not breed in Ontario. All the other ones were ones from my mesocosms that existed. They were the only ones. So this is super exciting. These are wild tadpoles that we didn't have anything to do with. So it's a really, really big good news story. that <laughs> um, The toads are actually doing a lot better now because of this. Um, and as you can tell by my face in these pictures, it really doesn't get much better than that. Um, the, the toads I'm releasing, they're surviving, they're doing okay, um, and they're helping to maintain these ponds that exist again, um, just like in my, in my mesocosms that we were studying. And so there's a lot of hope right now um, that this will continue and that the toads will keep doing well um, and that we'll get even, even more of them. Um, so I need to thank everyone I work with. I don't do all of this work on my own, um, especially my really great army of field and lab volunteers that we bring out with us um, who make my work like physically possible. It's a lot of, a lot of work to do this.
So thank you so much for listening, for your participation, and I'd love to hear all of your questions. Okay, uh, so yeah, we're, we're opening things up to questions right now. Um, feel free to uh, uh, raise your hand or just open up your mic and, and ask something. I'm also monitoring the chat if anybody wants to add something there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, while we're waiting for people to, uh, to ask something, I have a bunch of questions. Uh, and, you, and you know what, I'm gonna start with maybe the, the worst of them all. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, so you over the past I guess you uh, went back to 2016 right so you're going back five years and you showed uh the degradation of the habitat as Lake Erie was rising there um and actually you know uh, first question how high how high did Lake Erie rise to wash that beach out entirely so I don't know the number in meters the last time I was there was two meters up which is went two meters up two meters up. That is um, a huge change. Huge, huge change. Um, it went back down in 2021, thank goodness. But so there was a storm in 1989 that knocked all the houses, like all the cottages out. That's how high the lake was. And it had passed that level to knock out the dunes. So it it's an effect of climate change, basically. Um, we're getting more intense storms. We're getting more precipitation. All of that led to the lake rise and it also led to blowing the dunes out. Um, the the kind of issue with it is that it's probably a one-off event, right? It's probably not like actually maintaining itself this way. So, so it might not be a long-term solution. It might be a short-term one. We don't know how long it's going to stay. We don't know if another storm's going to come in. There's still a lot of uncertainty, such as the case with ecology. Um, but right now we're hopeful <laughs> that, that it's okay. Well, so that that's where I was going to go with this, because it mm -hmm. seems you're putting a lot of effort into something that to me seems like it might not be a long term solution. I mean, it's great yeah. that the, the the toads came back, but if they came back because there was this crazy freak storm. Uh, but really, you know, next year or the year after you're going to be right up there again. Mm -hmm. Is this is this a long term solution? Yeah, so we're actually looking into more long term solutions based on the success of this potentially short term solution. So one really important thing that happened during it was that the frag got knocked down. We were all cheering, super excited in May, okay? <laughs> June, so one month later, not a lot of time for a plant to grow, okay? It's a plant. But one month later, there was frag as tall as me back in the marsh. So it's already undoing. So we're looking into, there's a person in my lab who's studying different ways to get rid of the frag. Um, who's looking into if the toads get affected by adding certain special combinations of herbicides that are supposed to not affect aquatic life. That's what they say, mm -hmm. but like, do they? Yeah, um, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's basically the, the situation. Um, <laughs> but seeing if they affect them before they just like spray everything with them, because that's what Environment Canada would like to do. Um, looking into that, we're looking into ways to maintain the dunes lower so they don't become those cliffs again manually my supervisor is like let's just bring in a bulldozer i'm like no <laughs> there's no way to conservation we're gonna be like yes bulldozer um but other ways to do that so to kind of artificially recreate this um but an important part of this discussion is like is it worth putting that effort into something that might be doomed and it's a difficult conversation to have Right. It's like, well, of course, we think the toads should exist. They're the most important thing in the world to us. We study them. But like it's money, it's time, it's effort to maintain the species. And we know now that it is really important to do that because those species help maintain this habitat. And this habitat is a giant wetland. It cleans Lake Erie, right? Like wetlands act like filters to like bigger lakes. Um, so like it's we know these tadpoles are important, um, but a lot of conservation is a triage system. And it's what can we save with the resources that we have right now? And yeah, it's definitely a larger and bigger conversation. It's one that happens with things like amphibian arc, it happens with pandas, it happens with all sorts of things of like, at what point do we call it? Right. Uh, but we're not calling it yet. So. No. <laughs> but you, I mean, you also have to think about, you're talking about the triage system, but you also have to think about the fact that you're looking at one small little spot. Yeah. And you're putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into that one spot and just, you know, down the road, the toads there are getting wiped out. Yeah, 
right? So what us like? I the mean, there's got, there have to be solutions that that address mm -hmm. this on a much more broad level. Yeah. Because you know, this the north of Lake Erie isn't the only place where this is happening. It's happening. Yeah, it's absolutely time. not. And like, we work with a lot of people who work in in different areas. We all collaborate. We're trying to figure it out. But absolutely, it needs to be like global, kind of like systematic change too to address this. Um, and like a lot of what we're dealing with are effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. We can't fix climate change as just, I can, I can help the toads as much as I can, right? We can, we can do everything as much as we can, but yeah, there's definitely larger systemic issues with development, with invasive species, with how things are managed, um, that need to be addressed to, to save just more than just this toad species. It's, it's an extremely difficult yeah. question to answer. Yeah something that we hope to tr start trying to tackle yep. the SEGEP level uh, a little bit better than we do right now. Uh, Cause it's, I think it's one of the most fundamental questions facing our species right now. Uh, Lisi, I assume you turned your camera on cause you wanted to ask something. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if there are people studying other species in that environment and how mm. they are doing with these environmental changes yeah there are so i am really lucky in where i work and i get to collaborate with everyone so we know the turtle people we know the snake people um so there's people who study all different aspects of this environment and how how it's working it's basically acting as like a it's kind of a case study right if we have enough people looking at what's happening in this system maybe we can learn from that for other systems figure out what's going on there so um with the dune blowout the people who study the spotted turtles and the blandings turtles which are both also endangered species um they're also doing better they have more habitat partially because the toads are breeding so they're creating um part of habitat too everything's tied together um but they're also benefiting from these these dune blowouts um the fox snake population which is another endangered species is benefiting um, and the absurd amount of mosquitoes, midges, and dragonflies are back, which is great for everything that's not me. Um, but <laughs> so the, uh, the bird people who have a completely different schedule. So we work, our toads are nocturnal. So we work from about like 10 a.m. to midnight, sometimes 2 a.m. Like that's, that's the hours in the day, we, which is a lot of hours, but it's the hours in the day that we work. Um, so we go to bed at like 3 a.m. and which is when the bird people wake up. So like, they're, they're the opposite of us. We like never see each other in the mm -hmm. field. We're just emails because we're sleeping when the other one's awake. Um, but they say that the birds populations, they come in to migrate in long points, a really important area for these birds as well, um, because mm -hmm. it just sticks into the middle of the lake. Right. So it's an important landing spot for all these migratory birds. Um, and they uh, they're also doing better because of this this habitat so what's good for the toads is not just good for the toads it's good for a lot of species and the toads are also important for a lot of species so um in this mm -hmm. tied in ecosystem like all of these things are important for for each other Interesting. thank you and uh i've also i'm not really on top of what's going on but uh, maybe you've heard more no about this thing on um longay they were trying to build like a like a like a how is it called like a bridge so that the Renet Fogrillon, I don't know how to say that in English, could cross like from yeah. one area to another. Mm -hmm. um, There's a lot of studies on on those. Yeah, things. so I was wondering if uh, we are talking a lot about that species of amphibian, but are there other species that you know would directly benefit from that area and people should know more about? Yeah, so a similar thing happened in Long Point. Um, where there's, so there's one road into Long Point, super skinny. Um, and the road was just like a fricking graveyard. It was a mess. Um, it, they wow. killed tons of muskrats, tons of turtles, tons of frogs on it. And so they built um, tunnels underneath, not bridges that go over, but tunnels underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked actually there. Um, it doesn't work everywhere. The, kind of the reason it worked is because it's one road, right? <laughs> Um, and they built fences along it to funnel these animals through. And they thought that basically the herps would use them. So the frogs, the snakes, the turtles mm -hmm. would, would go through them. It ended up being used by like everything. So animals are very adaptable. They're a lot smarter than we give them credit for. So a lot of times if we make something that 
does work that a lot of animals will be like, okay, that works. And they will use it. Um, a problem that kind of consistently comes up though is we think we know what's best for them and we don't. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into things um, that like everything's so connected that it's really hard to determine what is going to work for these animals. Um, and we run into that problem again of that triage system and spending money and you don't want to spend money on it because you don't have very much in conservation if it doesn't work. So like, what do you do? Um, but you run into these cases of like, you, if you, no one tries, then we don't know. <laughs> so like, you gotta, you gotta try and, and see. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I believe this bridge system is a case of, okay, let's try. Um, and I think it's the chorus frogs, I think that they're trying it with. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a system like that. So if it works, it'll probably be used by a lot more things than just one species of frog. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know yet if it works. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any other questions out there? Still not seeing anything in the chat. Uh, I'm going to ask you a more specific question, sure. uh, less doom and gloom uh, than it's what conservation. We... There's a lot of doom and gloom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you showed those images uh, of the the two uh, natural uh, study systems that you just benefited from. Uh, I'm curious if you have any insight into why the tadpoles chose one of those ponds over the other one and yeah, didn't so... didn't reproduce in one of them at all. It's a great question. Um, we're trying to figure it out still. So in 2019, we had a plan that we were going to have a whole bunch of ponds. We were going to look at all of them. And then this huge flood came in. Um, and we couldn't look at any <laughs> except for those two. And for everything I could tell from then, um, the, the ponds were exactly the same. So we couldn't tell what was causing it. The only thing we could think is that the second pond was further away from um this area of like flattened grass and it's you saw the pit the total it hop into like the one blade of grass in the system they're not the most coordinated animals on the planet so it might have just literally been easier to get to so we thought maybe okay maybe it's just easier to get to maybe that's why they chose it this year um so 2021 i actually got to study all those ponds we were hoping to look at in 2019 so this is super preliminary as in like i made graphs two days ago but um the it looks like the toads prefer ponds with lower nutrients as well as ponds that are slightly warmer um, than other ones. So those ponds, like, so toads, they're sponges, remember? So they can tell if there's other animals in the pond, so if there's something that's going to eat their tadpoles, and they can also tell like the level of oxygen in a pond, things like that um, from soaking in this water. And so they, they chose the pond with slightly lower nutrients and slightly warmer. Now, the important thing with that is slightly lower nutrients um, would mean, okay, maybe that's why there was less algae. We, maybe we could explain that. But if you look, if I, when I look at my mesocosms with the amount of nutrients there, that it's like, it doesn't make sense. That amount of more nutrients shouldn't lead to that much more algae. So it's still a difference the toads are causing. And that fact that that pond was slightly warmer, we don't know why, but whatever, the pond was slightly warmer, would usually mean that there should be more algae in that one, but that was the one with less. Um, so yeah, this, they're still causing that effect. It doesn't look like it's an effect of the ponds being different, but still an effect of the toads themselves being there. Um, we think that's why, but the secrets to toads keep. <laughs> Don't know. Wait, hold on, sorry, I, I got a little bit confused there. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the toads are choosing ponds that are a little bit warmer, but have less nutrients, right? Yeah. But you were talking before about uh, expecting more nutrients to lead to more algae, right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be a good thing for the toads? So if we're talking more, about yeah. the uh, um, uh, the periplankton. Wouldn't that be a, a better thing? So they have, so you know, they can eat more point. because there's more periplankton. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. You would think they would want that. Um, it was what we thought. <laughs> it's what they would want. We also thought that the amount of nutrients the toads release would lead to more algae in those ponds with them that would probably help them out. So we thought was gonna happen. So it's a very, like, it's a good train of thought. Um, what seems to be happening instead is that 
So if there's a lot of algae growing when the toads are small, they get stuck in it. So they, it's really sad. I've had to, I've pulled some rescue missions, but the, um, they will actually get stuck in the algae and they will not be able to swim. So it ends up being detrimental to them. They also really don't like it when the pond gets like, they like the pond really clear. And so what seems to be happening is the toads graze down all of this algae. So there's like a thin layer of it on everything. Um, and then like the algae uses up more nutrients to grow back. So the amount of nutrients in the ponds with the toads actually decreases over time too. So because they're, it, the algae is using up more nutrients to grow back, it's getting eaten down right again. It's using up all those nutrients that are given. So they create these systems that are really like start low nutrients and stay really low nutrient because of that. It seems detrimental. Um, another thing that was brought up recently was that, so the, the Fowler's toads are not super great at surviving. <laughs> Um, they get eaten by everything, right? The, the reason they lay thousands of eggs is because there's safety in numbers, that's their strategy. Um, but like everything eats them, including like carnivorous plants. But other tadpole species will eat them too. And so if they choose ponds that have less nutrients, that might mean less food to start with. It might also mean that other frog species choose to pond with more. And if those frog species are eating their tadpoles, then they, they have a better shot at with slightly less food than with predator. Um, so it's like a selection process that, that goes kind of like that. We think anyway, um, that that might be what's happening. Could it be that at some point the algal mats are so thick that it's hard for the tiny tadpoles to mm -hmm. kind of graze on them? Absolutely. So they would, yeah. they would need to, they would thrive if the algal um, I don't know if the algae of the lake are at a certain stage that they can still graze upon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the stage and the type of algae is important too. So there, there's a type of algae called a uh, filamentous algae. Mm -hmm. And once that gets really long, it's harder to eat. There's also certain types of, um, of phytoplankton that are, they're like, uh, what are those candies? Like, you know, gobstoppers, like they're jawbreakers. <laughs> those ones are like, they're, they're <laughs> little balls. So like there, there are species that'll grow that are harder to eat. So something that we're hoping to look into that I have a bunch of samples for, but haven't gotten a chance to look at into yet um, is actually what species of algae are growing, uh, what that community mm -hmm. looks like, where the toads are and like which ones they're actually eating um, to see exactly what, what you said, if maybe it's a certain stage they need to, or a certain type of algae that needs to be growing, or maybe they end up kind of farming a certain type of algae, we really don't know. But those are all important, important questions to like the bigger picture, because a lot of other things use that algae too. It's an important carbon sink. It's an important, there's lots of important things with it. Um, so knowing how they affect us is an important part of the system. How many other frog species are out there or toad species? So there's one other species of toad who I also study called the American toad. They're great. Um, they, they act a lot like the fowlers do, but will are a lot more generalist. So fowlers are really picky. The Americans will breed pretty much anywhere. Um, and then there's bullfrogs, green frogs, leopard frogs, um, some salamander species. There's wood frogs, but they live further away. There's spring peepers and gray tree frogs as well. How have these guys been doing under the circumstances? So. <laughs> Uh, if that's a too complicated a question or too it's a, involved. <laughs> it's a complicated question. The short answer is that um, the lower water level is, seems to be being better for everybody. Um, the, the toad species are staying pretty separated, which is what we would like to happen. They aren't breeding in the same areas because American toads are supposed, they're supposed to both be herbivores according to the literature, but I put them together one year and they ate each other, so they're not. Um, but so American toads will eat fowler's toads and fowlers won't breed if there's Americans in the pond, but the Americans breed two weeks first, two weeks earlier. So we want them to not have bred in the ponds. We want the fowlers to breed in because then the fowlers can't breed. Um, yeah, so the Americans are doing pretty well because they're really generalist. So the species that can use lots of different kinds of habitats, like great tree frogs, like green frogs and bullfrogs, um, they, they're doing pretty okay because they're, they can use whatever they got. 
um, they're generalist species. The specialist species are having a much harder time, like wood frogs and like the fowler's toads that need very specific types of habitat because if they lose that one specific type of habitat, suddenly they have nowhere to breed. Um, and they fall into things that we call ecological traps. So things that look really good to them, but are actually not. Like a puddle in a gravel parking lot is a really low nutrient, empty, shallow pond. It's also gonna get run over by a pickup truck in two days, right? But the toads don't calculate that into effect and neither do things like wood frogs or spring peepers. Um, so yeah, some of them are suffering the same way, but definitely the one that's struggling the most is, is the, fowlers, the fowler's toads. Okay, um, are there, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, well, um, I think on that note, uh, we'll end today's talk. Uh, thank you uh, everyone for coming and thank you so much, Jessica, for volunteering your time. Uh, I, uh, I learned a lot. Unfortunately, it wasn't, wasn't great. You know, it's not, not looking, uh, looking looking grim but that's across the board for a lot of conservation issues i mean but you know what learning about this and getting that information out there is extremely important uh, and as i mentioned at one point uh, we talk about that a little in our class right now but nowhere near as much as i would like to so i'm i'm really glad that you were here to speak to our students uh, about this and uh, uh inform them and educate them about some of the perils that are out there for you know, maybe some of the less obvious species, you know, people think and hear about macrofauna, you threw out pandas at one point, oh, pandas are so cute, but there's a lot of uh, species that people don't think about that are really, really struggling and going extinct. Uh, so I I'm thrilled to have uh, had you here with us today and uh, to speak to this uh, for the benefit of our students. So thank you so much. Um, I guess that's about it. Um, unless a uh, few people have popped in, I guess to just to say hi and say thank you. Uh, Estelle, yeah. Okay, so- Thank you so uh, much for having me. Oh, you're, you're very, very welcome. Uh, welcome back uh, absolutely anytime. Um, I'll, well, you know what, if you just stick around for a couple of minutes, uh, we can chat uh, and I don't know, that's it. Thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.